This video is part two of my Team Fortress 2 mapping tutorial, so if you haven't seen part one, I would recommend it, otherwise a lot of this won't make sense. This video is also brought to you by Marketplace.tf, a community-focused place to buy and sell Team Fortress 2 items. This includes no fees for buyers, no minimum wallet balance, trusted sellers, and bots that make buying bulk a breeze. Sign up today for Marketplace.tf. So, your old pal Array7 has been mapping for about three years now. And in that time, you'd think that I would have put together at least some sort of decent project by then, right? <laughs> no. Truth be told, it's one of those things that just sort of fades in and out of my life. And because a finished project takes so much time, halfway through making it between school and work, my time gets a lot more limited. I lose enthusiasm, I get preoccupied with things, and whatever I started just gets tossed into the work on it later pile, which might as well be on the work on it never pile. Every time I get back into the hobby though, it's because I have a sudden inspiration to build something. And that inspiration is interesting, because it's so rare and it's so temperamental. It just shows its face whenever it feels like it, and then just slowly fades in its luster the more you get into the details about it. For me though, what's easier to come by than inspiration is motivation. And like any other craft, you've got to have good ways of finding it. For example, there are a handful of things that help me get into the mood to map. For one, it's YouTube. Now, there's this handful of videos that I've watched over and over again because, well, let's face it, the YouTube scene for this is... it's pretty dead. Crash's changelog videos, especially for Trenchfoot and Shore Leave, are fun, and I thoroughly enjoy seeing another mapper's creative process. His 72-hour payload crash video I still love and would also recommend, just because he's trying to make a map in 72 hours and you can clearly hear the enthusiasm die in his voice halfway through. Mega Pie Man PhD, who I'm still not convinced isn't Markiplier, has his change logs for King of the Hill Synthetic, which is one of the best cough maps I've ever played and is a really interesting watch. The thing I like about Mega Pie Man is that I see a lot of the same problems I have in him, and it makes me feel a hell of a lot better about myself. The way I make maps is I start a map with an idea, and I work on that map till I run out of ideas, and then when I run out of ideas, I move on to the next project. But the thing that got me to be serious about mapping was these two random level design videos I stumbled upon by Uncupa. I've seen them so many times I could recite them by heart at this point. You might notice that they, uh, they look awfully similar to my video in uh, structure and content and, well, number of parts too. But that's just because I really liked his work and I wanted to do something like it. So, if you want to learn more, go check out his video. It's a good set. So what did all this video watching motivate me to make? Well, to answer that question, we're going to have to pay a visit to the little island of Misfit Maps. Old to Duo Lookout was kind of a one-off project, just kind of me getting used to Hammer, I suppose. It, there's a lot of problems with it. Uh, recently, I did a remake of this map, however, and just kind of applied some of the newer skills that I learned, you know, practicing Hammer as well as I do. So if it's any consolation, whatever you start off now, you can always redo later. So it turns Old to Duo Lookout from this to this. Now, I think it looks a lot better, in my opinion. I'm very, still very proud of it. I think it's a good testament to how far your skills have come. Doing this sort of thing is, is great, because after a while, after you get better, you get to revisit things and not only see how bad you were, but see how much you've improved. And I'm still very proud of this map. I'm very proud of it. So uh, this is Shrink Ray. This is the uh, first actual map that I built. It was really difficult to cap the point. Whoever like capped it first pretty much had it for the entire game, and that is a running theme with almost all of my maps. You'll see that soon, but the map never really played the, the way I wanted it to. So a couple versions later, this is what Shrink Ray looks like now. There's a lot. There's I, there's a lot wrong with it, and truth be told, fixing them would really probably require an entire map design. One of these days I really want to do justice to uh, Shrink Ray, but until that day I think I will just uh, have to stick with what I've got. So uh, since my first map went over so well, uh, this is CP Wind Factory that I uh, decided to make afterwards. You know, I, I figured that there's wind that you sometimes hear in different maps, and I, I just had to ask where does the wind come from? Well, this is where they make the wind. Uh, this map had a lot of problems. This map had a lot of issues. Uh, for one, last was a nightmare. I don't know if you guys can tell from this, but it was A, Sentry Hell, and B, Demo Man Hell, and C, impossible to push into. Literally impossible to push into on blue side. It, it was a nightmare. I, like, we had to stop playing. It was awful. I'm, I am, I still to this day apologize to anyone who had to play this map. It was brutal. 
So this is Payload Graffiti, a uh, payload uh, urban themed map uh, partially inspired by, you know, some of that underground graffiti type. The idea was to have, you know, really stylized art all over the walls and everything. Uh, I never got a chance to test this map, actually, but the problem was I built this way back when I was still pretty amateur at, you know, map design and everything. And the idea behind this map was that Blue would be pushing a cart bomb into Red's entire supply of red paint so they couldn't, like, paint this. I, I don't know, don't ask me about this kind of stuff. They, the idea was that once the cart explodes, paint would just ricochet everywhere and splatter all over everything. And I think I might have bitten off a bit more than I could chew. I couldn't figure out what the hell to do with anything. I think I vastly underestimated how much work a payload map takes. And by the time I got to last and started trying to figure out all the logic, this, it was, it was daunting to me. I had to cut it. I never even got around to texturing the walls and everything properly. So this here is King of the Hill Little Maker, uh, my attempt at redoing Shrink Ray, because when I did Shrink Ray, I didn't really have nearly the uh, experience that I have now, and arguably am only slightly better than, th than I was back then. Uh, Little Maker was kind of a joke off of Shrink Ray, and I I played a lot with this map. I I had a hard time with Little Maker. Little Maker I was very proud of simply because I like the name, first of all. This is supposed to be a remake of Shrink Ray, because when I started this project, I had thought, oh, I'm a lot better mapper now. Maybe I can do the concept justice, and spoiler alert, no, no. This, this map wasn't particularly bad. It's just it had a lot of problems I didn't know how to fix. There was a lot of flanks that didn't make a lot of sense, and almost no high ground on the point, which is a problem for a lot of people. And I I didn't quite know where else to take the map, unfortunately. This here is Payload Tad Polish? I, uh, I noticed that the more and more I decide to start projects, the less I care about their naming conventions, which might be an indication of how well they're, they've been going. And suddenly I decided to do another Payload map, I guess, because the others worked out so well. Uh, uh. I, I lost enthusiasm. That happens with me a lot. I just lose enthusiasm for a project, and I just give up. And just know that if you're having a hard time with following through with projects, don't worry about it. You're you're not alone. The good news is that each of these projects, though, kind of has a part of them that I'm excited about, or at least I think is well designed and think is fun. Right for this one, it's last. The the farther I progressed the map, the less inspiration there was, and the more it was just made out of out of obligation to have this part, this part here, and this part here, and this part here. One of these days, I'll probably combine all of the parts I like into one big map, but now, for now, this is probably the best it's going to get. Tad Polish is just another entry in the long list of projects that Array will probably never finish. So as I mentioned in part one, in order to really understand what I'm talking about for these two videos, I decided to build a map myself. Now I had no idea what I was going to do, so I just named it King of the Hill Death Bagel as a reference to my old username and just started drawing. In the previous video, I mentioned taking an existing map and putting your own spin on it. So I knew I loved Yerzy's map Koth Bagel, and I love the idea of the nipple point here in the middle, so I aim to make an easy, uh, admittedly unoriginal, layout that combines the two rock things from Viaduct with a big-ass nipple in the middle. Since I already had it planned out, it only took me about a weekend's worth of work to get something playable and ready for testing, but even then, that's something that took me a while to learn. To save yourself some frustration, I would also recommend downloading and installing a Boojum Snarks mapping pack, which makes Hammer feel a lot more TF2 and streamlines a lot of things. So, building the map. Now, there are a couple of things I would recommend keeping a very close eye on. The first being your scale. Making a map too big or too small is pretty much pitfall number one for a lot of new mappers. To fix this, just plop a bunch of player models around your map and get a good reading on how big the player is. For me, I found that 64, 128, 192, and 256 units are the magic numbers for Hammer. 64 to 256 is the range most combat in TF2 takes place within anyway, and anything beyond that is pretty much just favor snipers and scouts. It's best to keep almost everything you do in that exponential family of eights. Most of the time, I'll stick to 16 hammer units for wall thickness, and if I'm ever in a jam for a doorway, I usually just take the various spawn door models and use them to size it. <laughs> also, your naming. I really like naming maps, or more importantly, coming up with goofy names for them. Sometimes I go with a name I would actually want it to be called if it was finished, but after a while I started to not give a damn and 
accept that it's probably not going to be finished anyway, so I just said, uh, whatever, I'll give it a goofy name. Tad Polish, Tad Polish, for example, was a joke my girlfriend kept laughing at the week I built it. Graffiti started just after I watched Exit Through the Gift Shop, and Death Bagel... is kind of just Death Bagel. Developer Textures. Go to your material browser and type in D-E-V. This will give you all the dev textures at your disposal. Use them when you start your brushwork, especially with these white and gray ones here. Why bother to properly texture something when at this stage it's pretty likely most of it's going to get moved around anyway? So just stick with white, gray, and team colored textures for your brushes. And maybe throw in a bit of ground too, just to make testing easier. The Grid. Now, treat this number right here as if it were your bank account. The bigger it is, the better. Mapping is difficult, and it gets a lot easier when you stay as close to the largest grid as possible. Brushes are easier to move around, you can line things up quicker, plus it means you can stay at a large grid, which just makes things easier to make changes down the road, and just keeps everything really neat and tidy. It's a good habit to get into. Compiling. Every once in a while, you should run around your map and try it out in-game. When you're working in Hammer, it's really easy to forget what things are like when you're actually playing, so it's good to every once in a while wrap it with a big old diaper skybox and run around the inside. It's important to view it from the player's perspective, and also make sure that when you decide to do this, choose a class like Pyro or Sniper that has a 100% speed. Faster classes will make you want to build your map bigger, and slower ones tend to make it being smaller. Using an average speed class helps mitigate the variation in walking speeds. Every map needs a theme, but it's better to design a map around a set of gameplay elements rather than a specific setting. That's how you get maps like Mercenary Park, and we all know that one is just barrels of fun. It's good to keep your theme in mind, but I wouldn't recommend building heavily around it. Out of all the parts of your project, I would say the theme is probably the most flexible one and least critical to the process, so don't worry about it for now. You can save that for detailing. Speak of the devil. Now, admittedly, I don't know much about detail. I, I normally don't manage to get maps to that point, but what I will say is that this is the last step in making a map, meaning that until you get to it, just do minimal detail at best. Maybe ground textures here and there, maybe a fancier skybox, but for now, just stick to rudimentary designs. It'll save you a lot of heartbreak. On the subject of heartbreak, this is something that I struggle with quite a bit. I just think of a cool idea for an element when I'm building, and I have so much pride in it that I refuse to admit it's awful, it's gaudy, and it's got to go. It's best not to get attached too much to things. Most of it will be changed later anyway. Sometimes you'll have an idea for something and get it tested, only to find out that players hate it and it's not fun. But no matter how much people are saying it's a terrible idea and you're being too stubborn to listen, and you keep trying to think of ways to make it work when it's probably not going to go anywhere and she just let it go, but oh, you feel so happy the way it turned out and you're desperately holding on because the one thing you have pried in and we're really excited to make it, and removing it would mean that all the heart you poured into it went about to nothing and that all that time and excitement was wasted. Just let it go, man. Trust me, it, it's for the better. I promise. <clears throat> uh, so, so now that Death Bagel is built, it's time to playtest. Playing your map is a hell of a lot of fun, and it's probably the best way to understand its problem areas. Okay, so this is the first test of King of the Hill Death Bagel. Now, the funny thing about the first test here is that I realized that my sight lines on mid are completely messed up. Uh, as you can tell, you could stand here and shoot across, you can stand in here and shoot across, and you can stand in here and shoot across, and you can even stand here and shoot, which I've seen a couple people doing. Uh, not a huge fan of that, so the first step is to fix that. I, uh, I'm considering keeping this as open as it is. Uh, I need to block off the sight line and to lower that. Um, considering putting some more ammo, maybe. Um, I'll probably make this one big yard. Um, okay, so, so something that I like about this is uh, this open space right here. So I've seen a lot of soldiers like jump through here. Right, which I, I like. It's, it gives a good uh, assault on the point here, which is, uh, you know, kind of what I want. I want this this whole thing to be played around like people are doing right now. It's good. I, I like this whole nipple point thing. Uh, right now, scouts rule mid, and I kind of want to find a way to make sure that uh, they don't. And what I'm considering doing is putting something down here to give this the top of the point splash damage. And uh, I think that'll help help get rid of some of the scouts a little bit. But uh, truth be told, scouts kind of rule King of the Hill maps to begin with anyway. Yeah, so big things are making this whole one better, bigger area, right? Making close, Maybe closing in the gap from spawn to mid just a little bit. 
and uh, lowering this down, and also fixing this whole this whole junk here. Uh, I don't know what kind of more problems that's going to. I don't know what kind of more problems that's going to cause, but I suppose we'll just find out how that goes from there. This is the second test for King of the Hill Death Bagel, and uh, this is King of the Hill Death Bagel Alpha 2. Uh, as you can see, as I mentioned last when I fixed some of the sight lines, quote unquote, by adding this low ground here, which, as I'm playing it now, I realize might have been a bit of a mistake. There isn't any high ground here really affected the way mid played, because when there was high ground here, the, uh, the mid changed hands quite a bit, but now with this low ground, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't change at all, right? And see, it also means that people can hang here and have be able to have cover of these three places, right? So if there's anything that this this whole um, this whole session taught me is that uh, I need to open not open up mid a little bit, but give the attackers more advantages because in order to defend, you have to be able to get to the other side of the nipple, because people can stand behind here and cap, and you'd be completely covered from anything. So people have to expose themselves in order to defend the point, which makes it hard to defend, which means it swaps back and forth. And in a King of the Hill map, you always, always, always want good back and forth. That's how you get a good King of the Hill map. In almost every King of the Hill map I've ever made, the team that caps it first usually keeps it for the entire round. It's just a running theme with everything that I've done. And it frustrates me because I don't always know how to how to balance it out, right? Like, like the, a map needs balance, especially in a King of the Hill map, and the mid needs balance. Anyway, a lot of this map, like I said, is modeled a bit after Viaduct, and people notice that. And while, yeah, I, I did that on purpose, I would like to stray a little bit away from the Viaduct formula. You know, it, it, I'm still a little new to this whole mapping scene, so I thought I'd just try with something safe for this whole connector area between, you know, mid and spawn. But, I mean, I think it gets kind of boring after a while, which I would like to avoid. I would like, you know, I, I want it to be exciting all the way through, and I don't quite know how to do that. In a second, I'll show you my favorite part of this whole map, which is this little ramp right here, which no one uses except, char except charging targets. Demo man, and I'll show you in a second because my god, is it fun once I respawn? But like, you see that people run through here and then go through the low ground, right? Like, I wish that there I go. <laughs> Takes a little bit of development, right? It's play testing, it's trial and error, and it, it's going to be hard, and it's not always going to be pleasant to get feedback, as I've mentioned before. But if anything, this is a demonstration of how a map goes from literally nothing to having a play test, having changes, and then having a play test. Is it improved? Arguably. Is it different? Yeah, sure. But for one, I think it's most important to remember what parts you like and what parts you want to keep and what parts you aren't proud of. For me, spawn I'm not a huge fan of, the area between mid and spawn I'm not proud of, and the right side of mid I'm not proud of at all, right? The, uh, the, the low ground, as I said. So, it's going to take a little bit. It's going to take a little bit of time, take a little bit of energy, and take a little bit of work, unfortunately. But, you'll get there eventually. And from here, the cycle repeats. Make a change, test it once or twice, then go make the next change. And the best thing about TF2 mapping is the community. All the mapper wants to do is improve their craft, and they do that by respecting and supporting each other's work. Being a part of this community is great, and being passionate about it has its own rewards. But getting involved means you need to give them the same regard that they give you. That means being respectful on the Discord, giving legitimate feedback, and most importantly, following all of the guidelines. It's all for the purpose of building something great, and with the help of your peers, anyone can achieve that. So, from me and the folks at TF2Maps.net, I hope you all can get into this hobby with us and help us build the future of Team Fortress 2. I'm the invincible, undefeated champion. Mount Zion's my ancestors can't rely on. Star of David, nah, the thought of Sodom. Modern dumb and done crumbs left to the dumb thumb. To this play button, glutton of words, mud 